So let me start by thanking the org, uh, Brian and the organizers for the invitation. Very nice workshop. Um, when Ben Lu already uh, uh, mentioned this and talked about this thing in his talk, that the induced, uh, in, induced uh, Compton uh, forces uh, provide a fairly stringent uh, limit on the location of the source. Uh, it can be either within few tens or few hundreds of kilometers of a compact object or far away. So uh, small distances where the magnetic field is very strong, the induced Compton is scattering is suppressed by a very large factor or at a very large distances greater than about 10 to 13 centimeter where the IC uh, acceleration and the forces are uh, not so important. I think this one doesn't work. I'll just... Uh, when we also showed this particular uh, graph, and that is the only point here that I would like to mention is the following. In principle, sure, we can, one can have the FRB at large distances, but that requires the energy to be very high. And this is the parameter space uh, showing the distance of the shock front uh, from the compact object and the luminosity requirement. So it's a very high energy requirement. What I, so this is, the, uh, this is the problem, in our opinion, certainly, for shock scenario and at distances greater than what you see here. So what I'm going to do for the remainder of the time that I have got, the talk is really going to be looking at a, a, a model where the FRB radiation is produced close in, in the magnetosphere of a magnetar, okay? within distances of few tens, maybe hundred, uh, uh, neutron star uh, radii. So the model is this, that you have a L-fane wave. Well, some magnetic disturbance could be L-fane wave that is launched um, uh, at a frequency of a few tens of kilohertz. And uh, from the surface of the neutron star, this is something that was considered three decades ago by Blaise, Blanford, Kolroig, and Madaw, but in a very different context, and that was to explain uh, GRBs in our galaxy. That was, this predates, their idea predates um, uh, GRBs being established to be cosmological. In any case, the point is that you have some magnetic disturbance that is launched. Um, the luminosity of this disturbance is something on the order of the FRB luminosity. So something on the order of 10 to 43 arcs per second, the amplitude of this disturbance is large in the absolute terms. 10 to the power 11 uh, Gauss is the delta B, the perturbation of the magnetic field. But the relative, the dimensionless amplitude, which is delta B over the strength of the magnetic field, that's small for a magnetar, 10 to the power minus 4. So it's a very linear perturbation in that sense. The perturbation does grow. This dimensionless perturbation does grow with distance from the object as r three halves. So you see the wave is moving outward, growing in amplitude, this relative amplitude uh, is growing. But for the entire regime of the radius of interest, it remains firmly in the linear regime. Okay, so that's one point. The other point is that uh, in, this, in this particular picture, the, 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 if you zoom in and look at the alpha and waves, uh, there is a current, there is a plasma current along the original magnetic field line as long as the wave, the disturbance, the alpha wave, uh, K vector is not exactly parallel to the magnetic field. Okay? So there is a non-zero current along the magnetic field uh, direction. That, that is the current. And that current is being carried by electrons and positrons moving in opposite directions, and at a high clip, at some, some fair fraction of the speed of light, at least few percent, more like 10% of the speed of light. And so these counter-streaming particles are subject to two stream instability, and, and that instability grows on the plasma time scale 
So which means that it grows on the time scale of nanoseconds or so. And in few tens of nanoseconds, you have formation of clumps with delta rho over rho of order unity. Okay? So that's one of the criticism that people had for very good reasons for how clumps form in the antenna mechanism uh, for radio pulsars. And so the alphane wave, it seems, it, off, it provides an, a, a way to answer that question. Okay? So that's one component of the model. Uh, the other component is the following. The current that is being carried, as I already mentioned by electrons and positrons, um, the speed at which they are moving, well, we can calculate that from the current dictated by curl of delta B and divided by the charge, uh, particle charge and their number density. So the V is something that is increasing with distance, with increasing radius. So at some radius, which is RC, the V becomes order C. And that's charge starvation radius, or that's defined as the charge starvation radius, which means that beyond this radius, the charge density, there's just not enough charge density to supply this current for the alphane wave, curl of delta B. Okay? So what happens at that stage is that electric field develops. To be precise, it is the time derivative of the electric field. The displacement current now is compensating for the deficit of the plasma current. So you have, you have a electric field that develops, a strong electric field that develops outside, well, outside of this charge starvation radius. And um, the direction, a component of this electric field, just like the current density, is along the magnetic field lines. So outside of the charge starvation radius, uh, what we have is a strong electric field and uh, particle acceleration and curvature radiation. And the way it works is this, that alphane waves now going outside of the charge starvation ra radius, this clumping, plasma clumping has been produced by the instability to uh, stream instability on a short time scale of, as I say, few tens of maybe nanosecond, the period of the wave or the frequency of these alphane wave is tens of kilohertz. So certainly something on the order of the, the alphane wave period is something on the order of tens of microsecond or so, where this, these things are growing on a time scale much smaller than that. Okay? And then there is an electric field along the magnetic field lines. So that accelerates these charge clumps and these clumps move, follow the curve magnetic field lines, and produce curvature radiation. Okay. And the, the electric field keeps, supplies the energy for these particles as they are radiating and they are experiencing this collective radiative reaction force. And that's a little tricky business. See, if the electric field is turned on very quickly, and that very quickly means on a time scale very much smaller than a microsecond, then particles will be accelerated individually in the sense that the radiation reaction force will act on particles individually. They are not going to be in causal contact such that the, radi the radiation reaction force is going to be applied on particles as part of a clump. In the former case, when particles are accelerated and the radiation reaction is acting individually on particles, then particles get accelerated to very high Lorentz factor of order of million or tens of million. And, and uh, when, when they are in causal contact and they experience the radiation reaction force collectively, then the Lorentz fac factor of the clump is limited to something on the order of a thousand. Okay? So it's very, very important that the electric field is turned on. But as I say, that is a natural thing because the alphane wave frequency is tens of kilohertz. So the electric field is turning on, on time scales of many tens of microsecond time scale. That's long enough that particles in the clump are in causal contact and they experience this radiation reaction force collectively. Okay. So, 
So the energetics for this process turns out to be quite efficient um, as per our calculation. Order unity, which means that order unity, fraction of the alphane wave luminosity and energy is converted to these coherent radio waves. So that's very different from the previous talks that we have heard um, where the efficiency is low-ish, quite low. So the total energy in an outburst for this particular model is not very different from the energy requirement for FRB, which correcting for the beaming, these things are beamed indeed within an within a angle of 1 over gamma. Gamma is the Lorentz factor of these clumps. So energy is 10 to 36 arcs or so. And um, the total energy in the magnetic field is much larger, so this is clearly not a problem uh, producing uh, multiple bursts or even large number of bursts. Right. Uh, some predictions, and, and, and they are, so maximum of FRB frequency, that is set by the size of these clumps, which is in turn set by the plasma frequency. Right? So, it's, so according to this model, uh, we shouldn't see uh, FRBs at frequencies greater than approximately 100 gigahertz or so. So that's the limit set by the plasma length scale. And the density at the alphane for uh, the, the, the plasma density uh, at this charge starvation radius is something that can be calculated with some degree of confidence. So putting it together, it seems like that the maximum frequency at which we can see FRB should scale with the luminosity of the FRB to a quarter power. So at least there is some this correlation expectation according to this model. Wenbin has already mentioned that the other consequence of this, or prediction of this model, is the maximum FRB luminosity, which is set by simply the swinger, swinger limit, the breakdown of vacuum and the electric field. This is not the electric field of the FRB radiation. This is the electric field that is accelerating these clumps of particle when that approaches to within about 10% of the swinger limit then there is a breakdown of vacuum, electron positrons are created, they short out this electric field, no acceleration of clump, well, no FRB radiation. Okay? So that's another prediction. Um, there is a minimum luminosity also, and that is set by the fact that if the alphane wave luminosity is small, is smaller than a certain number value, then Alphane waves don't become charged star. They will become nonlinear before becoming charged star. Okay. And so that's not going to, that's not likely to, although I'm going to defer to Roger here. He, he, uh, you, I may be misrepresenting, so maybe let, let me, let's just wait. Roger has a, uh, some interesting idea for a disturbance. Is it becoming nonlinear and then producing? FRB. So let's wait to hear if it becomes nonlinear. So point here is that at some luminosity, when the when the uh, alphane wave luminosity falls below a certain threshold, the wave is likely to become nonlinear before becoming charged star. And there is a, a story that we will we will get to hear shortly. Okay, but in any case, uh, that minimum for this thing is something on the order of. 10 to our 39 arcs per second, we are certainly close to it or approaching it. So time will tell. Well, there's a minimum frequency. That's just set by the causality argument. Just, just simple causality sets the, uh, uh, the largest wavelength that we should see or the smallest frequency that we should see, something on the order of 100 megahertz, which is also an interesting number. Um, for observers to check. This is something that has been covered. Uh, it's not a prediction, it's a post-diction. So Jason, you said you wanted to have post-diction, right? Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in my, 
post detection. Okay. Anyway, so I put that in post detection. He wanted to say, okay, what about post detections in an email to me? So here's the post detection, and I will not say much because there's something nicely covered um, in Win Win Lose talk. So um, I am repeating here what Win Win has already said. The natural prediction of this model, the is 100% linear polarization. It's only the X mode that is produced in the curvature radiation and that is able to escape from the magnetosphere. sphere, okay? So 100% linear polarization. The direction only changes of the polarization angle changes only because, well, in this model, if the magnetic axis is not aligned with the rotation axis. So our interpretation would be that for 12.1102, which, which seems to have a swing, polarization angle swing of 20 degree, that there is an angle between the magnetic axis and the rotation axis that is about 20 degree. That would be the interpretation according to this model. Right? And I, I'm going to stop. So let's just, just let me leave the summary slide and let's take questions. So,